The show Succession is a lot of things. It's a meme machine. Nice memes, good memeage, and, and uh, so on. Appointment television. You're gonna hate everybody but you won't be able to stop watching. <laughs> and it has another theme song that 100% deserves to be bumped at the club. But most of all, it's a pitch black comedy that tells the story of the members of a media dynasty vying for a spot at the top. And at the center of all this drama is Logan Roy, the patriarch played by Brian Cox. I mean, this is the highest possible compliment. You are a real son of a bitch on that yeah. show, I mean. Between inspiration from Shakespeare and serial killers, secrets only he knows, and a well-placed baby picture, here's how Brian Cox approached the role of Logan Roy in succession. We'll also explore how this approach majorly clashes with another member of the cast. Sometimes a lot of American actors, uh, they kind of treat it like a religious experience. <laughs> uh, oh, this, you know, it's so hard what I'm doing. You know? But first, make sure to like this video and subscribe to this channel for more behind the scenes insight into your favorite performances. Last one to smack the like button is a bore on the floor. It's a game, bore on the floor. I really, I feel. Get down! Bore on the floor. Bore on the floor. Kendall, ring the troops. Bore on the floor. Bore on the floor. As always, spoilers ahead. Showrunner Jesse Armstrong has a background in political dramedy from his days writing on Veep, but with Succession, he wanted to pivot away from straight politics into the world of family dynamics. Specifically, he took inspiration from media dynasties like the Murdochs, the Hertzes, and the families behind Comcast, Breitbart, and others. This inspiration is so apparent that the husband of Elizabeth Murdoch, basically the real life analog for Shiv Roy, once stopped Brian Cox at a cafe to tell him that Succession was sometimes too real to enjoy. Really, it's nothing like Elizabeth Murdoch. <laughs> uh <-huh -huh. laughs> Table Reads began the day of the 2016 election, meaning that the cast and writers had another famous family to look at for inspiration. There's also a more literary comparison to be made here. Many people liken the show's power struggles, artful wording, and the larger-than-life characters to the work of Shakespeare. And this is one of the many elements that makes Brian Cox uniquely suited to the role. Traitors! You! constrained and forced. In his youth, Cox trained and performed with the Royal Shakespeare Company and the Royal National Theatre alongside actors like Laurence Olivier. It's this experience of playing celebrated roles like King Lear and Titus Andronicus that informs every role he's played since. My training was everything to me. My training has made me the person I am. This makes sense on many levels. Thematically, King Lear, like Logan Roy, is a father trying to figure out who to leave his empire to. Titus Andronicus is also a father, and his story involves struggling with forces that challenge his family's supremacy. Although that one has a lot more cannibalism than we've seen in Succession, so far. But it's not just the power of these strong men that lend itself to Logan Roy. It's the tightrope act of playing someone who is at once so scary, but so human, and even a little bit funny. What, what, is, what is so extraordinary? Is it, why did he say that? Well, I, I mean, I, I really, I really don't understand. So that the, the brain is going in one way, and meanwhile, all this is happening. Cox sums up this dichotomy with a word he uses kind of a lot. See, I think there's a, an area between tragedy and comedy, which all tragedies have, which is this area of ludicrousness. Succession is a ludicrous show for ludicrous times. And it shows the ludicrousness of life. Uh, as I say, the show is ludicrous. What he means here is that Shakespearean training allows him to portray characters who feel like they're making all the right choices, while also showing the audience that their tragic figure is doomed to fail. The density of Shakespeare's language forces modern readers to look between the lines of dialogue for meaning. See here how Cox explains the difference between what's on the page and the scenario he imagines in his head. Have you ever been on a, uh, one of those suction machines in the, uh, what are they called? Rotary machines in the fair, where the floor goes away, right? I want you to imagine during the speech that that's what's happening to you. 
Knowing that this is the approach he takes when interpreting Shakespeare, we can only imagine what he's working with internally during some of Logan Roy's soliloquies. We're only ever seeing the tip of this classically trained iceberg. In an interview with the New York Times, Cox says he thinks his training sets him apart, especially from his American peers. The musicality of work they don't have. We are brought up understanding the iambic form and how that works. If you learn that as an actor, you understand that there's a whole musical sense at work. That's the classical root. As a Scot, I'm incredibly grateful to have learned that. Not everyone has. There's another famous Cox role that informs his performance as Logan Roy, a deliciously creepy one that goes down like a nice Chianti. I want you to help me, Dr. Lecter. Yes. I thought so. It's about Atlanta and Birmingham. Yes. You read about it? In the papers. I don't tear out the articles. I wouldn't want them to think I was dwelling on anything more than that. That's right, a full five years before Silence of the Lambs, Brian Cox was the first person to ever bring Dr. Hannibal Lecter to life on screen. Quick aside, Cox played Hannibal in Manhunter, only to be followed by Anthony Hopkins, who would later copy him again by playing Titus Andronicus. We're not saying this pattern means a Hopkins cameo is inevitable on Succession, but it never hurts to put an idea out there. Okay, back to serial killers. As someone whose career has been shaped by playing many despicable characters, Cox has unique insight into how to do it well. My belief is the more you present this, somebody as he is, the more scarier they become, because it all seems so rational, but actually it's deeply disturbed. And that's what becomes disturbing for the audience, is the rationality of somebody's behavior, which is, pretty vile. Cox is always looking for the shreds of humanity and reason that give his roles nuance and keeps them from becoming caricatures. This method is also why he keeps insisting that Logan Roy isn't actually a villain. You know, he's damned as the most horrible man in the world and what have you. But all he's trying to do is find a successor for his business. That's ostensibly what he's trying to do. And he's hoping that his kids step up to the mark. But week by week, they do not step up to the Mark. <laughs> Cox says in doing his research on the character, he found many points of similarity between himself and Logan. They both have tempers, they both overcame hard childhoods. Heck, the showrunner even changed the script so that both Logan and Cox come from the same small town in Scotland. In the original pilot, Logan is said to have come from Quebec, but Cox later had to go back to the studio and re-record lines to reflect the plot change. So where am I born now? Somewhere called Dundee, Scotland? I said but that's where I was born. Another cornerstone of Cox's approach to inhabiting difficult characters is deciding certain things about them. Cox says he makes definitive choices about his character's backstory and uses that information to inform his performance. For the Tough as Nails Logan, he and showrunner Jesse Armstrong decided on a surprisingly soft secret. Because I asked the question, <laughs> does he love his children? And Jesse Armstrong, our creator and showrunner said, yes, he loves his children, but they're just all pains in the ass. <laughs> Cox's insistence on this fact, a fact that neither the audience nor his on-screen children are ever sure of, makes his portrayal much more three-dimensional. Anecdotally, Cox also says that he decided that his character did not actually have an affair with Holly Hunter's character in season two, but that he likely did hook up with another key member of the ensemble. But I think he probably did have a fling with Jerry, the younger Jerry's. Which adds interesting context to this scene. I'll send you a picture of his dick by mistake. Well, it's pretty obvious. Uh, yeah, he meant to send it to Jerry. I don't get it. Like father, like son. Secrets and decisions aside, Cox says he differs from Logan in one major way. The difference is I'm an optimist and Logan is a pessimist and he's a misanthrope. I'm not a misanthrope because my job is to understand and, and really like humanity. And because of that difference, Cox lives his real life almost as a carbon offset to the toxicity of men that he plays. He even helped make a documentary series about the wealth gap called How the Other Half Live. I'm heading back to my roots, investigating why and how the wealth divide affects us all he also stays in touch with his roots by keeping a baby picture of himself near his script. This is a tool he used to share with his drama students, and he told the New York Times that it helps to have a photograph of that wonder and openness you had before everything started to corrupt you. Aw, they're so cute before they get a reputation for berating strangers. They'll come up to you and say, uh, could you say <laughs> off and you go. So you see, for all his training and backstory crafting, Cox is always careful not to lose himself in a role like many method actors, and his performances don't suffer from the ability to snap in and out of a role quickly. But I'll play the cook and see them ready against their mother comes. 
something like that. This approach sometimes clashes with more immersive acting tactics of cast members like Jeremy Strong. In an interview with GQ, Cox had to say this about Strong's method acting. He's got all kinds of stuff that I don't have as an actor, and I respect it. I'm only intolerant when it affects everybody, and if it puts everybody off their guard. He lets it affect him to such an extent that I sometimes worry about him, because it's intense to live at that level. Cox also said in a New Yorker profile of Strong, it's a particularly American disease, this inability to separate yourself off when you're doing the job, or more forcefully put pretend <laughs> just pretend Cox says that actors treat their craft like a religious experience, and to an extent, they're right. But he clarifies it should be an experience that they give to the audience, not one they take on themselves with monk-like commitment. His approach is sort of old school in this regard, but it definitely seems to be working. Maybe we can attribute all of his success, his intelligence, and brilliance on screen and stage to this one bit of advice he got early on in his career. You know, Brian, 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 he said, don't worry about all that star nonsense. Just say your prayers and be a good actor. So what do you think? Is Logan Roy a villain after all? Tell us that and what actor's process you'd like us to cover next in the comments down below. And don't worry, we're going to be diving deep into Jeremy Strong's preparation for the role of Kendall Roy very soon. We just had to do L to the OG first. L to the OG, dude be the OG.